God's name of self-disclosure. Whom shall I say has sent me? That was the question Moses posed to the burning bush who was speaking to him. Tell them Yahweh sent you. Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 15, I'm going to read verses 1 to 15. We, uh, we're going to look at verses 2 through 15 today. You'll remember why we're, we're doing it this way in just a moment. Mark 15, verses 1 to 15, as we're, we're looking now at the portion of Jesus going through trial, where he is subjected to a mockery of justice as he stands before Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor placed over Judea. Stand with me if you would, and I hope you have found this in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, see me after the service. I want to put one in your hands if at all possible. But we do have the text on the screen because we want everyone to be able to gaze upon the word. See it, hear it, speak it. It'll, it'll store itself in your heart more readily that way. Follow along as I read this passage. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. You read this, and it's easy to get exercised about the Jewish leaders, their vile hatred for Jesus. It's easy to get exercised about Pilate's uh, wimping out, really, even though he had authority over all of them. And it's even easy to get exercised about a criminal being released rather than Jesus. The question we have to ask ourselves as we study this, this tragedy of the passion of Christ is would we have done any differently? Thank you. Please be seated. I told you a couple of weeks ago that when you get to chapter 14, verse 53 of Mark, uh, through chapter 15, verse 15, this is a section of, of trials with uh, sandwiched in the middle of it a, a denial. We told you at the time that the trials, uh, there's three Jewish trials, or Jewish trials divided into three parts, three phases, and then three Roman trials. We've already looked at the uh, Jewish ones. You remember that the first one was this, this uh, hearing, preliminary hearing before Annas, recorded in John, and then the trial before the Sanhedrin led by Caiaphas in his house, very unusual, highly unusual. We talked about that then. And then an early morning session of the Sanhedrin where they determined that they needed to go ahead and hand him over to Pilate to 
Today we want to look at the Roman phases of trial. First of all, Jesus is brought before Pilate, Mark 15, verses 2 to 5. Then, then he's sent from Pilate to Herod Antipas. We're going to look at Luke 23, 6 to 12. And then is sent back by Herod, back to Pilate, Mark 15, 6 to 15. So Jesus is before Pilate. He's, uh, when, they, when the Sanhedrin plotted in the morning, they sent him over to Pilate. That's recorded in Mark 15, 1. And so, so we have... Jesus standing before Pontius Pilate. He was the uh, Roman governor. <clears throat> Rome occupied the Jews. And they placed their own uh, political governmental leaders just arbitrarily over the Jews. Yes, there is a Herod, a Herod Antipas, who's the king. We're going we're to meet him shortly. But he's a puppet. He's, uh, he's allowed to carry on as the king over the Jews to the extent that he complies with Roman rule. And you're going to read something interesting in, in verse 15. Or you're going to find out, or 14 and 15, that, that Herod, not surprisingly, and Pilate were not friends up until they find a common enemy in Jesus of Nazareth. And so in, in chapter 15, Verse 2, this proconsul, this Roman proconsul, stands as Jesus is brought before him in the early morning hours. And he asks him straightforward, are you the king of the Jews? Now it's interesting. The accusation, one of the accusations that's been leveled to him by the Jewish leaders <clears throat> is that he claims, he claims to be a king. And you're going to notice through this through, through Pilate's engaging uh, the first time and then when they bring him back, that he, he, almost, he almost taunts the crowd with this term. And you're going to see how he does this. He said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, and it's the only time he, he does answer uh, in, in these exchanges, you have said so. In other words, it's just as you said. You've correctly identified me. It's just, it's just as if he had said, yes, I am. But it's basically what he's saying is out of your mouth comes the truth. It is true. Well, the crowd, of course, is these, this, these Jewish leaders are stirred up every time they hear this. And <clears throat> Pilate says to him, he says, verse 3, the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate says again, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. They're just, they're crying out. <clears throat> he's a blasphemer. He's a fraud. He's a liar. He's no king. He's not my king. And so they're going through all these machinations and Pilate just observing them. Says there, have you no answer to make? They're laying a lot of charges on you and, and if if they stick the Jews could request the Roman government to execute such a criminal the Jews had no authority under Roman rule to carry out execution you remember in the Old Testament that <clears throat> that capital punishment under the Jews was by stoning they would stone a person to death when Rome occupied them they they lost any uh, authority to do that. They could, they could beat a person, strike him with rods, they could punish him in various ways, but they could not carry out the death penalty. Only Rome could do that. And so this is why they have brought him to Pilate. When you look at this, this exchange, Jesus made no further answer. And we're told that Pilate was amazed. He was, <clears throat> he was apparently stunned that someone facing such serious charges would not try to get out of them, make excuses, uh, have a response, beg for mercy. Jesus, as Isaiah 53, 7 said he would, was like a lamb before his shearers silent. Ready? 
to receive not only the punishment from Rome insisted on by the Jews, but the unleashing of divine justice, the wrath of God poured out upon him for the sins of his people. But even as all this happens, it's important to remember that, <clears throat> that wicked men often find themselves unwittingly fulfilling God's predictions. In fact, the apostles will pray in Acts chapter 4 when they're, when they're praying that the Lord would give boldness to them to witness. They'll say that, that Herod and Pontius Pilate did what you had ordained for them to do long ago. It's important to remember that, that even though wickedness may abound, and it may seem to go unabated, and it may even seem to overcome good and to, to set back good, that is not the case. As armed forces are moving into Mosul, Iraq, to take it back from ISIS, with all the atrocities that have gone on there, what they're finding is Muslims begging for someone to tell them about Jesus Christ. What they meant for evil, what ISIS meant for evil, God is overruling for good. It always has been. It always will be. And we have the confidence as the people of God, as those of us who have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, to know that what Romans 8 promises, that in all things, God is working together for His glory and for our good if we are numbered among those who have been called according to His purpose. And it is happening here. What is despicable and detestable and inexcusable is working out what Paul would call a far greater weight of glory. In fact, wicked men oftentimes unwittingly fulfill the scripture. Peter, Peter said in 2 Peter, in the last time scoffers will come. Folks, we live in the day of scoffers. It's always been that way, but it seems to be intensifying in our land. We won't go through the litany of things we could go through, but <clears throat> you don't have to read very much or look very far, and you see people from all corners scoffing at Christianity, mocking the followers of Jesus. We don't mean to be despairing about that. And when you see the wickedness of these people, you contrast it with the meekness and lowliness of Jesus Christ. And I said meekness, not weakness. He is not the victim here, even though he appears to be. He is in control and is submitting himself to that very thing for which he came to this earth and left the splendor of heaven. He's accused by many things. He does not defend himself. Peter exhorts us in 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21, if, if when you're doing, doing well, you suffer for it, receive it patiently. This pleases God. He says, you're called unto this because Christ himself also suffered for us. And he left us an example. And I've told you before what that word example is. <clears throat> it is literally, he left us, Jesus left us in this model he has as he stands before his accusers. It's literally called a, it's a writing under. We can trace the conduct of Jesus. And we can learn to be good at suffering when we follow the example of Jesus. Notice 
also in this how fickle Pilate is. You get the sense that he wants to let him go and the text will even tell us here momentarily that he, he picked up that there was he was only there, Jesus was there not because of some miscarriage of justice or because he'd broken the law, but he was there because the, the leadership envied him. And so Pilate, trying to give Jesus an out, Jesus will not take it. And so he finds out in our text that he's Galilean. Look at as he sends him to Herod Antipas. Now Herod, this, this particular Herod, before we read the Luke passage, was the same Herod who had John the Baptist put to death. <clears throat> he was the son of Herod the Great. You'll remember that Herod the Great, when the, when the Magi, when the stargazers came through seeking him who was born king of the Jews, Herod the Great is the one who ordered the execution of all babies two years old and under, all baby boys, so that he could, he could head off this illegitimate king in his, his mind from causing trouble and taking his throne from him. He's the uncle of Herod Agrippa who would be the one who would execute James the Apostle by the sword. And would have done the same to Peter if Peter had not been miraculously released from prison. So here is Herod. Let's, let's look at Luke 23, 6-12. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time, when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he'd heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes, who followed him over there, of course, stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in, a splint, in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. Herod's curiosity was, was nothing but carnal. There was no spiritual desire to know, to hear from someone. He, he no doubt had heard about uh, Jesus' reputation for silencing the religious leaders, his reputation for healing, for performing miracles that no one in, in, in their day was doing. Herod was hoping to see some, hoping to get him to do a miracle for himself, see it. But that doesn't go anywhere. And so as the religious leaders press in, accusing Jesus intensely as they had done in their own trials as they've done before Pilate and now before Herod. He mocks him. He dresses him up and it's, it's, there's an irony here, folks. Pilate mocks him as the king of the Jews. Herod treats him and in, puts on royal clothing on him. No, none of them believing he is the king of the Jews, but all of them giving symbolism to, picture to, Jesus' kingship. Now they're having sport with him, and it's not pleasant. Jesus has been up all night. He's been, he's been beaten by the uh, guards of the Sanhedrin. He's now being mocked and no doubt <clears throat> uh, struck by Herod's cohorts. enduring all sorts of physical pain 
though he's done nothing wrong. So Pilate used the term, are you the king of the Jews? Herod dresses him up like a king and then sends him back to Pilate. And the text says in, in Luke, verse 12, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they'd been in enmity with each other. It's fascinating. You've observed this, I know. You know the old saying, politics makes strange bedfellows. Let me tell you something. People who can never get along find common ground with a common enemy. How else do you explain the phenomena that, that radical Muslims are cheered on in their hatred of Christianity by the LGBTQ crowd and their despising of Christianity? When, if radical Muslims had their way, they would execute every one of the LGBTQ crowd. Yet they have common cause. The silencing of the agenda of Jesus Christ. It's always been that way. I told you when we were studying through Mark in the earlier section of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, didn't agree on much at all. They debated theology at every turn. Sad, the Sadducees were the more liberal wing of things. The Pharisees were the more fundamentalist wing of things. But they did find common cause. They did find agreement over this. Jesus Christ had to be executed. And so here we find Pilate and Herod become friends this day. They agree something needs to be done with Jesus. And so Herod sends him back. So he comes back before Pilate in verses 6 to 15. And we're told in this that it was the, at the Passover there was a custom that Pilate had developed. It was, it was sort of his throwing an olive branch to the Jews during Passover that he would, he would release to them a Roman prisoner of their choosing. And he sees this. I, I think Pilate really miscalculates the crowd. He sees this as an opportunity for the crowd to speak over the religious leaders and ask him to release Jesus. <clears throat> We're told about this fellow in verse 7 who had, during an insurrection, with an insurrection, of course, children, is, is when you would rise up to sort of o try to overthrow the government, in this case, try to overthrow the Roman government, and he had murdered at least one person in that attempt, was arrested, and no doubt was awaiting execution. And so the crowd approaches him. Do for us what you've done in the past for this, this Passover recognition. Notice what Pilate says, verse 9. He answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Now watch the progression here. He asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, it's just as you said. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Now remember, at this point, Jesus is now dressed royally, thanks to Herod. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Giving him that, that title. Verse 10 says, he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up, that it, <clears throat> it was just it was a personal thing. And Pilate was not desiring to go along with it. There was no love lost between Pilate and the Sanhedrin. They had a mutual disdain for one another.
So recognizing that, he thought there was a way out for the crowd to cry out for Jesus. Pilate then would be duty bound by the tradition he established to give over Jesus to the crowd. But notice how sin will, will make you completely insane if you let it go. The chief priest in verse 11 stir up the crowd. You get the picture here. No, tell, him, tell him to Barabbas. Tell him we want Barabbas. Barabbas is no friend of the Sanhedrin. In fact, for Barabbas to be released in all likelihood means that down the road there will be another attempted insurrection against the Roman government which always threatens the well-being of the Jews. Tell them to release Barabbas. So they began to cry. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Verse 12, Pilate says to them, What shall I do with the man you call? No, notice the progression here. <coughs> Jesus. He asked Jesus, Are you king of the Jews? What shall I do with the king of the Jews? Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Sanhedrin didn't call him that. The people wondered, is this the Messiah? But the religious leaders have, have done their work. They have influenced the crowd and have people in the crowd to begin to cry out, crucify him. He says, why? Pilate says, what? The crucifixion is a, is a despicable death. I've told you before through the years as we've studied on the subject of the crucifixion of Jesus that it was a, it was a form of death devised by the Phoenicians <clears throat> to state in the way it is carried out that this person is so vile that he does not need to touch earth as he dies. His death needs to be suspended above earth. It's also a form of torture. The very nature of the death when the cross beams means that a person when suspended, uh, usually with the Romans they'd be suspended by nails, nails driven in the in the wrist or in the hands the feet folded and driven through the feet that the victim is there hanging under his own weight the prophecies that tell us that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree and of course the crucifixion is the cross is made from a tree the wooden beams that Jesus would appear cursed. In other words, he would appear to be there because God had counted him cursed and allowed him to be executed. The Romans were doing it to inflict ultimate suffering because as the victim hung there, initially able to pull himself up by his own strength so that he could breathe, he would lose strength over time and would be battling, struggling for that. And so anytime he would drop to this position, his ability to breathe would be cut off. And if you know anything about fear responses, you know the number one fear response is the loss of breath. If you ever had the breath knocked out of you, you know what I'm talking about. It's a painful, frightful thing. <clears throat> and this is what the crowd is asking for. You see, Jesus could have been beheaded. That was a Roman form of execution. Crucify him. Treat him as horribly as a human being can be treated under Roman rule. And when Pilate asked, what evil has he done? They cried out all the more, 
crucify him. And here's where Pilate shows that he basically is a man trying to find a way to maintain favor with the people and not have to put down another insurrection. Wishing to satisfy the crowd, he released Barabbas to them. <clears throat> and then the text just says, just having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Folks, the scourging of Jesus was the inflicting what the Romans called 40 lashes minus one. They believed that to be beaten with the instrument that they used to beat a man with, it was a whip with nine tongs, nine, nine leather pieces. So a nine-fold whip tied at the end of each piece of leather was either a, a sharp metal object or a sharp rock. <clears throat> 40 mat lashes minus one because they believed that 40 lashes would kill somebody. And so the, the, the instruction is to beat him nearly to death. And this is the beating he, in, he would endure from the Romans. The prophets would anticipate when they would say there was no form or comeliness about him that we should admire him. Because when, when Roman soldiers who are experts in this particular torture carry it out, there's not much left to look at when they're finished. And they're not careful about where it goes. They would typically aim for the back, but if it goes around the shoulders, around the neck, around the face, that was no concern of theirs. They would lash and tear, lash and tear. He was handed over, scourged. As we look upon this gory sight, I want you to remember that in the releasing of Barabbas, there is a powerful gospel picture. You see, the guilty is set free while the innocent is sentenced to death. The great sinner is delivered. The sinless one remains bound. Barabbas is spared. Christ is crucified. It's exactly how God pardons us, brothers and sisters. How he justifies the ungodly. You see, Christ was delivered over for us, the just for the unjust. We deserved punishment. I was my own Barabbas, a rebel against God. I was deserving to be cast into hell as were you. And yet a mighty substitute was given for us. In fact, all of us by nature are in the position of Barabbas. Guilty, wicked, worthy of condemnation. When we were without hope, the scripture says, the innocent suffered for the ungodly. And now, Paul says in Romans, God set Jesus forth as the propitiation for our sin. Big word. What it simply means is the sin bearing, wrath appeasing sacrifice. So that in doing that, everyone who would look to Jesus Christ with, with repenting faith, what the old divines called it, with a repenting faith, a, a confidence that Jesus Christ 
was a worthy substitute and he, he did what he said he was going to do and God honored it and yet doing that with, with repentance knowing that it's our sin that was put upon him that everyone who looks to Jesus with repenting faith can be declared not guilty and accepted as righteous in the sight of God Barabbas was guilty but that day he was released and Jesus stood in his place so in, in all of the awesome and awful specter of the passion the gospel shines forth gloriously and so with tears as we read about how they crucify our Lord and we'll be looking at that it can be tears of hope and rejoicing he came to die he was born to die born to offer himself as the substitute and as he stands there before Pilate after the beating unrecognizable that's what he came to do for you and for me so for those of us here today who are followers of Jesus Christ, we can, we can celebrate the good news of a crucified Savior who would rise three days later. And we enter into a season where people are going to be amazed at the birth of Jesus, where they, where they still allow <laughs> the nativity. And we can celebrate that not only because of the preciousness of the baby that was born, not only because of the miracle of the incarnation, we celebrate that because we know where he was going. And we, we say here, we'll be putting, when we put our decorations together, there'll be, a, there'll be a manger as a part of the display, but I want you to know it is empty. There's a reason it's empty. Because Jesus didn't stay in it very long. placed in it as a baby to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man and head to the cross and I want you to, as we go today remember the manger is empty the cross where we're going to see him hang as we study Mark in the month of December the cross is empty today and the tomb is empty and because of that you don't have to be empty. You don't have to be empty. Your life can be filled with the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus emptied a cradle, He emptied a cross, He emptied a tomb, and He came to live in you and to fill you with joy and peace and believing and hope for this life and the world to come. Behold your king, the king of glory. And we can sing with joy in this Christmas season that we have a Savior. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name and we, we gaze with painful astonishment again that how our Savior was despised and rejected by men religious people who should have known better and how for our sakes he became a man of sorrows all too acquainted with unspeakable grief. Help us to behold Him today as our King of glory. For those of us here who are followers of Christ, help us to live in these days while people are perplexed with uncertainty. Help us to live with the certainty that we have a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And for those here who are not yet Christ followers, oh dear God, 
show them that if, if they open their hearts to Jesus, that he who emptied the cradle, emptied the cross, and emptied the tomb can fill them with life. Mm -hmm. Life now and life in heaven eternally. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me.